Welcome back to Code 3 and the case of Desiree Sunford. In Part 1, we covered the interview with Desiree's husband, Scott. And even though Scott provided detectives with some bizarre answers, they had no evidence to arrest him, and Scott was free to go. Detectives interviewed Paige Blades, where she admitted to the three-way relationship with Scott and Desiree. Even though detectives had strong suspicions about Scott and Paige, there was not enough evidence for an arrest, and the case went cold. Fifteen months after the murder of Desiree, police get a call from an anonymous tipster claiming they knew the identity of the killer. That tipster? Paige Blades. Code 3 presents Part 2 of the case of Desiree Sunford, the interview with Paige Blades. Stopped on the way in. Okay. Um, give me just a second. I've got to grab my notes. All right. Hi, Paige. Hi. Long time no see. Long time no see. Hopefully, uh, we won't be saying very much to each other after this. Well, now I don't know if I should take that as an insult or a compliment. A compliment. Okay. You that know is. everything's being recorded now. Yeah. Okay. I kind of expected that. You're right. You're right. Because <laughs> I say this isn't your first rodeo. Unfortunately not. <laughs> I've dealt with a few too many of these things. Drop everything here. Before we start, I need to let you know that we're being audio and video recorded in this room. Because mm -hmm. we're here at the sheriff's office. Right. So with that in mind, I'm going to read a little introduction so that anyone listening to this later will know what we're talking about. Um, following statement concerns the shooting of Desiree Sunford on or about April 7th, 2013. Today's date is July 30th, 2014. The time right now is 14.01 hours. Location is the Yakima County Sheriff's Office. Present during the statement are myself, Detective Sam Parole, Detective Dave Johnson, and uh, Paige, is it Blades? Is, is it? Blades or Ackerland, they go by both. Okay. Um, so what's your full name? Paige Camico Mercedes Ackerland Blades. Okay. And, um, Ackerland being maiden, Blades is my married last name. Okay. So, oh, what's your current address? 404 South Maple Avenue, Warden, Washington. Okay, so it's the same yep. as before. And what's your date of birth? 4-30-89. Okay, and you understand we're, be, we're being recorded right now? Yes. And do you have your permission to keep recording? Yes. Okay, so the obviously the big reason that I wanted to talk to you face-to-face -face was that um, we got a Crime Stoppers tip um, from you uh, with some new information about the shooting. Yep. Um, did a little research based on the information that you sent us and um, found a picture of Marty Grismer. Is that the gentleman that we're talking about? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Would you mind just initialing and di putting the date below that? Normally I would do a montage, but you were so specific with your description about who it was that I felt pretty comfortable. He looks a little bit different now. Okay. How, how does he look different now? Um, he, he has hair. I can show you. It is quite a difference. Yeah. Well, he was about 18 in that picture, and he's 10 years later. Okay. 
So during in the tip, um, you were pretty specific about um, some new information that's come to light. So why don't you just tell me in your own words what you've heard, uh, how you heard it, and I think that's a, as good a place as any. Yeah. Um, well, Last week, I had Scott over. He was there for the week. And um, we were arguing. And Marty, his wife, um, is was my babysitter at one point. And we had been up all night uh, arguing and talking. And I asked Marty to come over and get the baby. Um, so he came over and he picked him up and it was, everything was fine. Scott was asleep. told him what was going on and um, he asked me if I wanted him to take care of this new woman like he did Des and I asked him what he was talking about The first time you came to see me, I was pregnant. We had just found out about three weeks before the shooting that I was pregnant. Marty was one of the first people that I told. And apparently, he decided that if the baby was Scott's like it was supposed to be, then Desiree would cause issues. Oh my god. So did you told Marty that Scott was the father of the baby? Oh, Marty knew that Scott and I were together and Scott was the only one that I was seeing. And he's smart enough to put it together. Like he asked me for sure if it was Scott's and I told him yeah, because at the time I thought that was the case. The night of the shooting, you know, Scott and I went to dinner with a co-worker, mm -hmm. and I had asked him to come over, and I always paid his gas whenever he made extra trips. I was a little bit short on money, and I asked Marty if I could borrow $20. So he came over and dropped the money off. We sat and visited for 15 minutes or so, and then he went home because he had to work the next day. It was pretty late at night, but then I had my $60 that I could give to Scott for gas. So he already knew that Scott wasn't going to be home. What he told me on Wednesday was that he had gone home, gone to sleep for a couple of hours, and he got up. I can't look at that. He had an extra clip of some old ammo that he had bought in a few years ago. He ran out all of the ammo in his backyard until he had a single clip left. He had a gun. It was untraceable, unregistered, and uh, he said he took it, he made sure that everything was wiped down, completely clean, no fingerprints on anything, none of the bullets, reloaded the clip. <sighs> he turned his phone off before he left the house, and he took 24 out the back way to Scott's house. <sighs> Marty was my best friend for a long time.
Scott had given him a tour of the house a couple months before. And he knew that I had a key there. He knew that there was a key outside. Do you know how he knew that? Because he knew our routine. He knew... It was just stuff that we talked about. I was excited about getting the house. I was excited about everything was new and, you know... It was just stuff that we shared. I never told him where the key was hidden. He said it took him probably 15 minutes to find it. He got the key. He went in the front door because he knew that that was the closest to the bedroom. The alarm went off when he opened the door. And Ada came out barking. Des came out right behind her and he shot her. He shot her three times. She went down. He shot her some more. I don't... I don't remember how many bullets he said. It was a full clip. He let her get, I don't know, 10 or 15 feet away. And he got closer to her as she was trying to crawl away. He wanted to make sure that she had an open casket funeral. He went to the back of the house and moved the board off the window that Scott had put up after the robbery. Oh, that's not awkward at all. Is that him trying to call you? That was Scott trying to call me. His dad's here with me. I only told him that I was setting up a meeting with you. I haven't actually talked to him yet. Uh, so he doesn't know the story about Marty? Is he going to react uh, possibly violently, do you think? That's why I didn't tell him. I waited for him to leave before I even could wrap my brain around the whole thing to put him a tip. So Scott Jr., he doesn't know any of this yet? No, all he knows, I sent him a text message yesterday just to tell him that I was setting up a meeting with you. How, how um, close were he and Marty? I wouldn't say that they were extremely close. Marty was my best friend. Marty and I started dating for a little bit until he found out about Scott, and I told him I couldn't see him anymore. But we were friends. We would go out together and stuff. Uh, they didn't. There's there's an old lady in Yakima. It's Scott and does his old neighbor at the apartment. Marty helped me take care of her, and sometimes him and Scott would get together up in Yakima um, to talk about that. That was how Marty found the house and got the tour of the house. Was because he was up there to see Lori. So he goes to the back. I think that he said that he exited the back door, walked out, walked back in to make it look like he had come through the back door because it was raining that night and he wanted to leave shoe prints. He put the key back in his hiding spot. He went back inside again grabbed a jewelry box off of her dresser, and he left. Did he describe the jewelry box? I think he said it was the little one. So it's a little, do you know what color it is? It's brown. I think it had gold trim. Do you know if there's anything distinctive about it that we would be able to say, yes, that's uh, Desiree's. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it in so long. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Mm. I think that's the one that she put her uh, her scrap jewelry into. If she lost an earring, she would put the other earring into that that jewelry box. Uh, rings that she didn't really wear very often went into that jewelry box. So did Marty say what he did when he left? He said he went home, started a fire in the burn barrel, burned all of the clothes, his shoes, his gloves, got in the shower, got ready for it, and he went to work. Did he say what he did with the gun? Not that I can recall. I didn't ask. Did he say what he did with the jewelry box? I think he said that he had it in the closet in his bedroom because he offered to bring it by if he wanted to see it. He wanted to prove that he had done it. You mentioned he lives in an apartment now with his wife, but he used to live with his dad. You know, is, is he talking about the closet, bedroom closet at his apartment at or his dad's house. at his dad's? A lot of stuff got left behind when he moved into the apartment. So he, he kind of keeps a bedroom there at his dad's house? Kind of. He, uh, he still has a lot of stuff there. Most of the important stuff, uh, daily use, got moved into the apartment and uh, some extra stuff that was too much for the apartment got left behind. How long has he been living in the apartment? Uh, they got married in September. I think she moved, I want to say, in March. March of this year? March 14th? March of this year. Might have been sooner. I know that the original plan was March I haven't slept very much. <laughs> so he, the first time that he told you this was Wednesday, last Wednesday? I'm pretty sure it was Wednesday. The 23rd? Yeah. At, at your house? Yes. And did he just start going into detail or did you have to kind of prompt him? Mostly he just told me everything. I asked if he would get away with it. And that's why he told me that he burned everything and he made sure to take the back way out because there's no cameras on those roads. Um, I remember that he had gotten into a wreck and at that time he was driving a rental. He wasn't in his normal car. You don't know where he rented it from though? I don't remember if it was our insurance or if it was the dealership that got it for him. But I know that it had Utah plates. And it was silver. I think it was silver. Do you recall what kind of car it was at all? I want to say it was like a Camry or a Prius. Something small like that. Is he a big gun guy? Does he have a lot of guns? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, um, he's avid. He used to carry $1,500 cash just in case he came across a gun that he had to have. Um, <coughs> I don't know if he has them in the apartment or if they're all at his dad's, but I know that he has told me that he has built some of his own guns. Um, and he's done a lot of modifications. Do you know that? He has one that he used to carry in his car. I don't know if he still does or not. And that was a pistol. I think it was a 40 or a 45. 
What's his dad like? Is his dad a gun guy too? I only ever met his dad once, and that was at his wedding last year. Um, so I honestly don't know very much about him. At the at the beginning, you said that um, Marty brought it up by saying, "Do you want me to take care of this woman like I did the last one?" Wh which woman was he talking about? The one that Scott's living with. Scott's living with another lady right now. Where do they live? In Richland. How long have they been together? Um, he moved in August or September of last year. Do you know her name at all? Johnny. Or last name? Cracked, I think. K R A C H T. And you said that you've had a baby that you originally, you said you at that time you thought it was Scott's? Right. Do you think differently now? My ex made me get a paternity test in December. And what did that show? I found out that it was his. That's your ex's? Dylan? Yeah. It, did you say December? So how often do you see Scott now? He usually comes for about a week, once a month. Okay. Did Scott have any idea that Marty was going over there that night? Not as far as I know. And had, had Marty made any comments that would make you think that he was going to do something like that? No, I know that he always talked about it. He always told me that if I ever had a problem, he would take care of it. And I always told him that it was the... Had he offered to kill her before? He's offered to kill her, he's offered to kill Dylan, Scott. It doesn't matter. If, if, if I have a bad day with a coworker, he always tells me there's always plan B. And so he's plan B. Just up for killing anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's told me before about supervisors. I know where they live. Just give me the word. Do you know of anyone else that he's told the story? My ex-girlfriend. Who's that? Her name is Stella. Neil. N E A L. N E A L. Yeah. Sorry, who's that? Stella Neil. Stella, Neil? Mm -hmm. <coughs> he told me that they all knew. When did she tell her? He, I guess he told her before when it happened. Did she ever mention that? I mean, she never mentioned it, or? After the shooting, I stopped. I didn't go out anymore. I didn't really talk to my friends. I. I have almost no contact with any of them in the last Where's year. Where's Stella though? Apartments in Moses Lake. Um, Why would she hold something like that? Because Marty pays her phone bill. Marty was paying her bills. He was taking care of her. So she, best friends. She's pretty tight. Marty, yeah. I would say if you trust her that much. Yep. How old is she? She's 25, I think 
mean she's just a couple months younger than me. Do you know what her birthday is by any chance? Mm -hmm. Yep, it's the day after Scott's. It's July 20th. Her and I guess some of her neighbors. Some of Stella's neighbors know too? I think there was like six people. Did he, when, when did it come out that he told all these people? How did you find that out? And towards the end, he said, I thought Stella would have told you by now. And that was just this past Wednesday? That's why instead of saying that he had told me when I left the tent, I just said that it was rumors. I don't want it coming back on me. Did he tell did he tell anyone else that you're aware of? I was surprised to find out that he told them. Yeah, it is the kind of thing that you would think you would keep to yourself. Well, and that they would probably tell me. That's the part that I don't get. Because I introduced Marty and Stella. And then once they started hanging out, Stella stopped talking to me as much. She started using drugs this past December. Our friendship just died. What kind of drugs is she using? Um, she was using meth. I think they all smoked pot. So is that the kind of group, when you say Stella and her neighbors, is it a, like a group of meth users? Um, yeah, it's, they live in low-income um, apartments, they're kind of all shady characters, actually. I didn't like going over there. She would always get mad at me because I wouldn't visit. You mentioned that, um, you think there might be shell casings in the backyard at his dad's place from where he was target practicing? Yeah. Did he mention specifically target practicing with the gun that he used? Did he talk about practicing first or? No. What was it? No. How was All how he was said was that all of that ammo except for the one single clip had been spent about two years before. Oh, okay. So he didn't necessarily say he shot it there. He just said he shot up a whole bunch of ammo and had one. He uses the backyard. That's where. That's where all of his ammo is expended, yeah. Okay. That's what he said was they can try and dig down to find the ammo if they want, but I don't see him wasting the time. Are you familiar? Have, have you been to his house and his bedroom and his dad's? I've never been to his dad's house. I found it on a map only because of the very distinctive driveway that he told me about. What's distinctive about the driveway? It's shaped like an H. It's got an H driveway? And the house sits right in the middle of the top. So has he talked about any special places he might hide a gun if he didn't want it to be found? I can think of. What did you, at the end of that conversation where he dropped all this on you, um, how did that conversation end? Did, what did you tell he him? He just said that he had to go home. 
that was getting late. He said to go shopping or something. Have you talked to him since then? Yeah. I talked to him for a couple of minutes at work the other day and uh, sent him a message yesterday to find out if he was working through the shutdown or not. And that's it. Our relationship is pretty much uh, come to a standstill. Well, yeah, this definitely throws a monkey wrench into things, I would say. It's not been a good week, that's for sure. If you initiated another conversation with him, do you think he would talk to you about it more? I'm sure he would. He worships the ground I walk on. He's obsessed with me. Is that something that you would consider? That's all I could think about the last two days. What a, what if there was a situation where we could put a wire on you? Would you be willing to talk to him with a wire on? Yeah. Because yeah. that might be the, the best, the most effective way to get, get it in his own words. Because obviously that, that will mean the most um, if he's saying that he did it. I was going to try and talk to him more on Friday and, and record, and at the last minute I decided that I needed to get a hold of you guys before I tried to do anything on my own. Yeah, you need to be careful um, about uh, recording people in Washington State because it's a two-party consent state. That's what I thought. And um, if you did it on your own, it may not be admissible because they may say you're still acting on our behalf. Right. Uh, but if if we do it, we'll do it legally and we'll get, there's kind of some extensive paperwork that I'd have to go through in some court orders and um, we'd make sure and do it right. We would have surveillance teams in place um, to keep an eye on you and him. that's something that you would be open to? If it means he goes to jail and this whole thing can be over, yeah. What do you, th if, if you had to guess, you know him, he's, he's one of your best friends or was. Um, once, when we approach him and start talking to him, what do you think his version of events gonna be to us? I'm innocent. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. But what What if we play the tape for him and say, well, here, we have you admitting that you shot him. Is he going to say, well, I did it all because I love Paige, or I did it because I want to make Scott happy, or is there a chance that he's going to say, well, Scott told me to be there at this time? <coughs> I think that if he was going to say anything about it, it would be because of that was always his focus and his main goal was my happiness. And that's the way he explained it to you is that he did, he, he thought, let me summarize, make sure I understand. He, he believed that, well, you were pregnant. Mm -hmm. At that time you thought it was Scott's baby. He believed it was Scott's baby. He thought that Desiree was gonna make problems for the two of you. And so he decided the best way to fix that problem was to eliminate her so that you could be happy? So that we could move forward, yes. Well, how did he feel about Scott then? Because that's a strong emotional connection if you're willing to kill for someone, yet you weren't with him anymore, right? You guys dated for a short time. Right, very, very briefly. He was okay being your friend and just wanted, to, as a friend, wanted to make sure that you were happy. Taking care of And that him. no one bothered you. He's the one that got me the house. He bought my car outright cash. Um, I still haven't paid him back for it. He pays my insurance. He's done my grocery shopping. He's taken very well care of me, yes. 
What does he do for a living? He's a team lead at the plant that I work at. He's, I'm sorry? He's a team lead at the, the plant that I work at. In Moses Lake there? Does he make that good money? Uh, yes, it's $25 an hour. But to take care of your bills and take care of Stella's bills and his new wife? Before he got married, he had a lot of money. Now that he's married, he doesn't have that much money anymore. What's the company's name that you work for? East American Foods. He's been working there for 10 years. And he told me one time that he tries to make sure that he has no less than $16,000 in savings at all times. He has money. <coughs> or at least had money. The way I understand it, his wife has pretty much bled him dry. She's not a very pleasant wife. Is there any chance that when we pick him up, is, is there any chance that he's going to say that, yeah, I did this for Paige, and she knew about it, she told me to do it? I think that's always a chance, but I couldn't see him. I couldn't see him. Trying to do that. He's always been a very honest person, as far as I know. And if he did say that, it'd be a total lie. You <laughs> wow. Yeah. And the question's oh. got to be asked. Yeah. Because it will be asked, you know, right. as we go forward. I cried more after Desiree died than Scott did. It hit me a lot harder. Did you and Scott live together for a while after that? No, we, um... We were pretty inseparable there for probably a month or so. And then his depression kicked in. And we kind of drifted apart. We talked about him moving in. And then he got this new girlfriend or whatever, moved in with her instead. Again. you thought a little bit about where and a wire? Have you given any thought to where, when or where the safest place to meet him might be? We work together, but I would really hate to do it at work. Yeah, I don't think that probably wouldn't be, <laughs> that would be very horrible. discreet. Yeah. Uh, a thousand different places. So it wouldn't, you guys are close enough to where you could call him and say, hey, meet me here, and it wouldn't be a big deal. You guys pretty much do yeah. stuff together. If, uh, yeah, if I said, hey, you know, I need to see you or I want to talk, he's pretty well. He might have something the wife needs to be done, and then, and then he'll see me. But usually, especially if I can catch him right, right as he's leaving work, he's usually got some time. I didn't sleep at all last night trying to figure everything out. I don't know whether to feel guilty or betrayed. Does Scott Sr. know about this new information? I guess and no. We uh, we talked a little bit about it the other night before I gave all of the rest of the information. He told me that I had to say everything. Um, I didn't tell him that I heard it directly from him. Though. What is his take on telling Scott? He's keeping quiet and letting me decide when to do that. No. Um. I think that's a t that's a tough call. That's a touchy situation because we don't want to end up with another shooting on our hands. Because 
any man's natural reaction when they find something like that. That, that was his him. dad's initial reaction was, let me meet him. Mm -hmm. And I said, I've already put in tips. I'm trying. I'm trying to get this going. Mm -hmm. I said, I, I could do that for you, but yeah, I don't think that's what we're going for. It's not going to help anyone if uh, they yeah. end up in prison right beside him. Yeah, and, and that's what I told him. I said, you know, you could do a lot of damage or we could just put him in prison. So you haven't told anybody? No. No, Scott's dad is the only one that I really told anything to. I had to tell my mom um, just a little bit that I was coming up. She was in the car with me yesterday when you called. Okay. And she asked who it was and what it was about. And I told her I had to come up here today to meet with you. And she has my kids. So his dad doesn't even know that I'm sure about it. Are there any other details that um, he gave you about the night of, about how we did it? or? All that keeps playing back in my mind is her trying to crawl away. Did he give you a, a time frame about what time he was there? <laughs> I think he said he was there 3 or 3.15. I might have that mixed up. <laughs> it's a lot to try and process. What was your reaction when he started telling you all this? I was in shock. I just mostly just sat and listened and I asked him how he thought he was going to get away with it. What do you say to that? I said, I already have. But he just told somebody. When, when do you think he would call the police or go to the police about it? I don't think so. Given my past, I don't think so. I think that he believes that you he think you, He thinks that you would protect him to the end? I believe that he believes that, yes. You obviously didn't work today? No. The plant is shut down for two weeks. Okay. So um, it's not uncommon that you'd be gone today. I mean, right. everybody's gone. Yesterday, um, we had a corporate event, and that was yesterday was our last obligation for work until I think it's the 11th that we're going back up. But he's working the whole time. You said that he carries a gun in his car or used to? I know that he used to. Does he carry a gun on his person? Not usually, no. And as far as I know, the wife is pretty um, psychotic, so I don't know that he even has guns in the house. I'm really not sure about that. It never really occurred to me to ask. Did he say if he's talked to her about it? I asked if she knew, and he told me she didn't. And then I got to thinking about it, and I know that he's miserable with her, and she has a very large life insurance policy. And that part kind of freaked me out, too. <laughs> a very vivid imagination. <sighs> he said... He told you specifically that the jewelry box that he took from Desiree is in his closet at his dad's house still, and he could bring it and show it to you? And he told me that he had stashed it in the closet at his dad's house and that he would bring it to me if I wanted to see it. Because I asked him, how did I know he was telling the truth? Did he, did he offer any other signs of proof? Any other, was there any other evidence that he could give? That I don't think so. The jewelry box was already mentioned. 
Do you see why he took that? I didn't even ask. It, it seems like such an insignificant detail. It honestly never even occurred to me mm -hmm. to ask. I guess I thought later, why the little one and not the big one? <laughs> You think it's just filled with junk jewelry or mismatched jewelry? Yeah, if I remember right, that was that was what she kept in there. She had a few different jewelry boxes. What about the burglary that happened the week before? Did he talk about that at all? Did he have, admit any involvement in what was going on there? He was just aware of it. It was a perfect storm. Just, just aware that there was a board on the window. Right. He knew about that because originally Scott had thought that Dylan was the one that, that broke in. And Marty was my best friend. Marty was the one that I talked to about everything. So I told him about it. He caught me in a bad mood at work one night. I just kind of went off. So he already knew about that. So were you communicating with Marty very much during that weekend and afterwards? Did he drop out of sight for a while or did you guys stay in contact like normal? Um, that night after he left and then I think the next day was the Super Bowl. No, it wasn't, there was something going on. Because the next day when Scott went home, I was at my friend's house and we were watching a sports event. Might have been NASCAR. It had to have been the race. I don't remember if I talked to Marty that day or not. I think that he had said something about being tired and not having been able to sleep the night before. We didn't talk very much. And I don't remember if it was the day that I saw you or the day after uh, I told him about the shooting. He helped me and he followed this story very closely. He, uh, he would find news results that I, sometimes I just had to take a day off. I couldn't, I couldn't read anymore. I couldn't think about it. I, I would just take a day off and then he would bring me new, hey, this is what the news is. He was very supportive. We were very close. But he said he said specifically that he shut his phone off when he drove from Warden to Yakima. Yakima the I night of. Didn't turn it back on until he got home. Does he have a, a fancy phone or is it uh, just a regular old? He's I think he has a Samsung still. It's, it's a smartphone. He has a smartphone? Okay. Does he does he ever carry a, like a throwaway phone with him that he might have had not with him? Not that I've ever he's, not that I've ever known about, no. He's had that same phone. As far as I know, it's the same phone, same contract. It's when we started dating, all he had was a landline. And within, I think, two weeks, he had gotten a cell phone. He has never changed his number, and I don't think that he ever upgraded his phone. It's not a Samsung. He still has an iPhone. He has an iPhone? He has an iPhone. I remember that because I had an iPhone. So timing wise, coming up, are there certain days that work better for you than others in terms of if we were going to try to catch him on a wire? Dylan's picking the kids up on Friday. I have to pick them up on Sunday. 
I don't think that really matters what day between now and the time that the plant comes back up. Do you know uh, what hours Marty works? I think it's 7.30 to 3.30 or 7 to 3.30. It's 7 to 3.30. Monday through Friday. Sometimes she works overtime. questions that you have today. How often have you seen him since the shooting? I work with him. You work with him, so you see him every Pretty much every day. <clears throat> Did he seem different after the shooting? Was there anything that strikes you that, you know, I mean, this guy just killed somebody. There would be some kind of change or reaction, or did he ever say anything? There was nothing. He was just very concerned about me. He he asked a lot about mine and Scott's plans. He asked a lot about if we were moving forward, what we were doing, how we were doing, uh, stuff like that. But I always just thought that it was him, me and Marty, checking in and saying how Doing. And then the last Wednesday is when he told you. Right. And that was at your house. Right. Was there a reason why he was over there that day? Or he just he show was, up? No, or? he was picking up the kids. He's picking up the kids. Yeah. Well, yeah, he took both of them because he dropped my oldest one off at the sitter. Because he was... Scott and I had been arguing, and I wanted to sleep. So he took the baby overnight. Okay. His wife usually babysits for you? She used to babysit for me. Used to. What's her name? Elizabeth. Same last as him? Yes. So that was a planned meeting? That was, yeah. And so, just to clarify a few more things, how did it... How did you, did you blurt it out, or? I was explaining to him what was going on. Um, With you and Scott? Yeah. And that he just, he asked me, do you want me to take care of her like I did the last one? So you were talking it's, to him about Scott and his new gal. Mm -hmm. And that you were going to go see Scott that day? No, Scott was already at my house. Scott was he, coming. He was already there. He was asleep when Marty came. So he's still seeing somebody else, but he's still seeing you. Right. Okay. He's living with somebody else and still seeing me, yes. Okay. And how long has that been going on? Uh, August or September of last year, he was out there. So. Almost a year. So even though Scott's seeing somebody else, you still allow him to stay at your place now and, and see him? Yeah. Okay. And were you about ready to break up with Scott or tell him this is it? I, I was, I've been thinking about it. But relationships now. So, so he just offered that he could take care of this other one like he did the last one. Referring to misery. Yep. I found out that Scott was lying about a lot of stuff, and that's what we've been fighting about. And Scott was what now? Scott was lying about a lot of stuff. For instance? Um, the status of the house. Insurance, death certificates. What was he saying? That... Well, we had been trying to figure out if we were going to keep the house, run it out, sell it off, let the bank take it, 
Um, I had just found a company to come in and clean up the crime scene. It's it's still sitting. It hasn't been touched. Um, uh, said that there was insurance and he couldn't get it without the death certificate. He couldn't get the death certificate until his name had been cleared legally. He was having trouble finding work. He figured because of the background check, because of his involvement with the case, he was just frustrated with everything. So you're sharing that with Marty? I think a few times I've mentioned it um, throughout the year because Marty was always very condescending about Scott, about how he needed to, you know, man up and go get a job and he needed to go. So why? His responsibilities. What What was the conversation that that really probably drew Marty's comments out, saying I can take care of this next one? I mean, I. I barely told Marty that night that Scott was living with somebody else. That's the first time he heard about it? Yeah. And I told him that I thought that we were going to be breaking up and that I was tired of the situation. He asked me if I wanted him to take care of it. Did you relate to him your feelings to Scott yet that you? What were your feelings for Scott? He's betrayed my trust. And he knows it. We talked a lot last week. So why instead of taking care of this next gal, why not take care of Scott? He's offered that too. I've always told him no. I've always told him no about everybody. Did he, I mean, he offers, okay, I'll take care of this other gal and you can have your life with Scott. Is that anything like that or what? I think that's what he's trying for. Even though you were done with Scott because Scott sleeps around? It's not because he sleeps around. That's not the problem. The problem is that he's a liar. The problem is what? That he's a liar. Could Scott have worked any kind of a deal with Marty to take care of Desiree? Mm. I really don't think so. Did they know each other very well before this? No, they had only known each other for probably four months. Before this? Before the Before Desiree shooting. shooting. Yeah. What was the name of the neighbor that you guys helped out? Lori. Lori? Mm -hmm. What's her last name? Segalini. S E G A L I N I. Is she elderly? Is yes. She's 61. She'll finally be officially a uh, senior citizen this year. And that was kind of what brought. Scott and Mar Scott and Marty together, other than the connection through you, they would go over and help Right. Um, Marty had all of the money and Scott had all of the time, so it was, Marty was traveling back and forth from Moses Lake to Yakima, and Scott was already in Yakima, so he would already stop and check in on her. She would call him whenever she needed something, and sometimes Marty and Scott, um, if one of them, one or the other of them had an issue, then they would get a hold of the other one and, and work it out. Is there anything else that you think we should know about? I'm trying to think. Marty said it was a nine millimeter. Did he say what kind of what brand? I don't think he mentioned the brand. 
he said that it was a nine millimeter and he was very careful not to break the glass in the den. Not to break the glass mirror? In the den. In the den. So he made sure to angle himself so that the bullets, if they went through her, would not penetrate the glass. He made it look random. Instead of just shooting her and getting it over with, he made sure to shoot her in the legs, the chest, the stomach. I didn't even kill her until I could get the back. I think she would be pretty good at it. Did he talk about, did he get very specific about how, about Desiree and her reaction when he came in the door? And the, the dog is barking, you said? And the dog is barking. He said she came out, didn't grab her gun and threw her body. She was naked, or mostly naked, and um, had something on her leg. Scott told me later that she was due for surgery. She screamed. She jumped and she screamed when she saw it. And where was she when she jumped and screamed? In the den. She was about halfway out before she saw him. Did he tell you how she was dressed or anything like that? She just described that. Oh, I'm sorry. Naked or mostly naked, with a covering over one of her legs. You were soft voice, I missed that, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, Happens when you have a hearing impaired guy. <laughs> I apologize. Glad somebody caught it. Had, had Desiree ever um, seen Marty around? So Scott gave him a tour of the house. Was that was it? the first time she ever met him. But when he got the tour, mm -hmm. so she would have she would have known who he was, but not didn't know him well. Right, right. That was yeah. That was the very first time that they I can't think of any other questions that I have today. Um, I would um, very much like to research uh, getting a wire order and having you wear a wire and, and to talk to him to try and capture this in his own words. Um, like I said, that's gonna, that's a pretty intensive process. It's uh, they just don't hand out wiretap orders. It's, there's a lot of paperwork that I'm going to have to do. It'll take me at least a few days to work through the paperwork of it and get, get it signed off on by a judge. And I'll need to coordinate with some of our um, people who, who specialize in, in wires and surveillance and stuff like that to coordinate with them. So it's, it's going to take me um, a little time, but I'll um, definitely try and stay in contact with you to let you know how things are progressing, to talk about time frames. Uh, um, I'm sure when we meet with the wire guys, they'll have uh, a lot of different suggestions and things like that. Um, did you, do you have any other questions for us today? Well, I, I really appreciate you coming forward with this information, and um, it's something that we're going to take very seriously and, and work on right away. Um, but I know that it took a lot of courage for you to come and talk to us, being put in a position that I you I was going to call you um, originally, actually, and I wasn't sure if you were still the detective on the case or not, and that's why I went with the anonymous tip. Yeah. Uh, I would like to have you sign um, this sworn affidavit. It's, um, I'm going to ask you initial where it says, I orally gave this statement to the officer, and the officer recorded what I said. I gave the officer permission to record the statement. And then I'm going to ask you to sign below where it says, I understand that this statement may be used in a court of law and may be used by a judge in determining the existence of probable cause for any charges that may be filed as a result of the described incident. This statement is truthful and accurate 
and I made it voluntarily, knowingly, and intelligently, without any threats or promises of any kind. I certify or declare under penalty of perjury under the state, under the laws of the state of Washington that the foregoing is true and correct. Does that sound accurate? Yes. Okay. Just ask you to initial there and sign down there. This time, I'm going to conclude the statement. The time right now is 15.04 hours, and I am Detective Sam Perrault. Police now had a name and asked Paige Blades to see if she would wear a wire and get Marty Grismer to confess to the killing. In part three of the case of Desiree Sunford, we will present the interrogation of Marty Grismer. Please subscribe so you can be the first to know when part three goes live.